Thank God. Um, my name is Michelle. I'm the education curator here at the museum. I'd like to start us off today by reading our land acknowledgement. So we acknowledge that the Museum Los Gatos sits on the ancestral land of the Ohlone, the Tamian Ohlone, and the Mwakma Ohlone people who have stewarded this land throughout the generations. We recognize their connection to this region and give thanks for the opportunity to live, work, and learn on their traditional homeland. We pay respect to their elders and to all Ohlone people, past, present, and future. So thank you for being with us today. Please feel free to come find a spot inside. And I'll pass it out to our deputy director. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Thank you for being here tonight. My name is Kimberly Snyder, the deputy director. I'm so grateful to have in-person events again at the museum. Um, first, I'd like to start off by thanking our sponsors of the show, um, Valley Water and San Jose Water Company. I think they're perfect uh, pairing for this exhibition and the themes going on. And then most importantly, I'd like to thank you, Marie. This is an absolute gift. <laughs> Marie's been involved with the museum for quite a long time now. I mean, I've known you for as long as I've worked here, which has been about nine years. Um, and Marie has been in a lot of our group shows. She was in the Water Lines exhibition. She was also in the Greater Bay Area Open. She was also in Art in the Time of Corona. She also was our artist representative on our board of directors a few years ago. So Marie has quite a long relationship with New Mew, and it's just so wonderful to finally see this body of work together for the first time. And the museum had the pleasure of doing so. Um, I'd also like to give an opportunity for Sally Water. Isabella Millet is going to talk about uh, a few words about what the Good Work Valley Water is doing in our, right here in our community. Um, one of the things about the museum is our mission statement is we're locally relevant and globally connected and we're living in such a trying time where we really see climate change. You know, over the past, you know, so many years you can really see it where it's wildfires or oceans and this is just really speaking to our area and the world. So I think it, it's perfect. And without further ado, I'll give it to you, Isabella, so you can say a few words. Yeah, I'll keep it brief. I know you didn't come here to hear a sponsorship message. <laughs> um, but my name is Isabella, and I'm currently interning with Valley Water in their government relations department. Um, and I'm actually also an artist myself. I study sculpture at uh, UCSB's College of Creative Studies. Um, and I just finished my own show about climate change. So I feel a lot of kinship and admiration for Marie in this exhibition. Um, and what I wanted to talk about really briefly today is just how Valley Water can support all of you in your efforts to um, mitigate the overconsumption that Marie talks about so beautifully in the show um, and just contribute to greater sustainability in Santa Clara County. Um, so I'm just going to cover a few really brief things and then I'll be around for the rest of the exhibition if you have questions, I have flyers. Um, one of the programs that I'm really excited about, this is only my third week at Valley Water, so I was excited to learn about it, is the Landscape Rebate Program. Uh, where you as an individual homeowner can receive up to $3,000. Um, and if you control a commercial site or a multi-family site, you can receive up to $100,000 uh, to take out your lawn and replace it with drought-tolerant plants. And that's really wonderful because not only is that great for water conservation, but those plants are often native to this region um, and can be really beneficial to the native pollinators and native wildlife and just the ecosystem in general. Um, and then another resource from Valley Water that I wanted to highlight is our free online shopping cart uh, where you can get water conservation oriented items for your home. So that's like water efficient shower heads, faucets, plumbing guides, um, landscaping guides, and all of that is completely free of charge if you're a Santa Clara resident. Um, and even like cute stickers promoting water conservation. Um, so really I'm just here to help you to transition the, the energy and engagement that this beautiful show is going to create. Hopefully, momentum, hopefully it will make you want to take action. Um, and then I'm just here to help you translate that into reality with the resources that we have at Valley Water. So I'll be around. Please come and chat. But now, for who we're all really here to listen to, is Marie. Thank you. Um, thank you. I just want to say, for those of you at the entrance, please come find a spot. I will go get some extra chairs and stools for mm -hmm. us. So please come inside and join us. And there will be time for questions after Marie shared with us today. So thank you.
Okay. Thank you so much, Isabel. I really appreciate Valley Water's sponsorship and the, and the sponsorship of San Jose Water for this exhibition. Um, it's wonderful to have this vibrant museum that is MEMU. And um, it, it's supported by community members, by members um, who take out a membership at MEMU. And um, what they do for artists in the area is just incredible. So I want to have a deep thank you to um, all the staff at MEMU for this. And in particular, I'd like to thank um, Cristiano uh, Colatoni and um, the curate who is the exhibitions manager and helped me install this work. Um, or I help, I was present while he installed it and he, he put up with me while I put this, <laughs> this puppy together. And to Julie Erickson, who is the head curator here. So they made a studio visit uh, several, I think in the spring, summer of 2021 to see this work and usher it into the museum. And uh, previously, a former director, uh, Lisa Casino, and uh, curator, Perry McGrath, had, had seen this work and kind of earmarked it for, for new view as well. So, very excited. I'm so grateful for my community, for this museum, for my family, and uh, the wonderful arts community that just really has come out for, your, for all of your support and for being here. And a special thank you to all the members who have, uh, all of the friends and community members who have contributed clamshells to this installation project as well. I, you know, I, I was amazed at how much material I do go through for, on a personal level, um, but still it wasn't enough to create this, so I'm, I'm deeply, deeply grateful. So, um, I wanted to also thank um, Kelly Ferraro, who did the design for this catalog, and uh, John Seed, who wrote the exhibition uh, essay. Um, just, he's an amazing writer, and they're all free to take, so there's one, um, as you go out, there's a little a box to take one, and I highly recommend just hearing his beautiful words. They're just filled with joy that he really saw what the work was about and was able to translate that into his making parallels with all kinds of our historical references, so. Fabulous. Is everyone happy where they are? And can please let me know if you can hear me okay and just do a little bit of okay. <laughs> so this work, Critical Maps is a very low tide, talks about environmental situation in the Anthropocene. And if you're not familiar with the term Anthropocene, it's the condition of humans living on this earth and how we have accelerated situations just by our presence. We are like um we're a very successful species. We're a very rapid species, and um, we're not always sure of what our impact is because it's it's immense. And some of these creatures are very small and not very charismatic, like a like a panda or an elephant, which desperately need their protection too. But I I grew up in Nova Scotia. I was born in New York City, lived an early life in Maine, and then grew up in Nova Scotia. And I've always had this very deep connection with the ocean. Um, and low tide in particular, it's this magical time where the ocean drew back and revealed itself what was underneath. So where I grew up in Nova Scotia was beside the Bay of Bundy, which has the highest tides in the world. It's absolutely magnificent. So that what you would see at low tide would be these magical animals and I, I would play with them, I would collect them, go through the shells, and I think it's that natural curiosity at a young level that, that bonds you with these and makes you care. And you see a shell and, and um, at a young age you don't realize what kind of organism lives there, but if you study a tide pool, you can see this web of life just moving around and they're all connected. Now we are also connected to that web of life with our actions. So each of these pieces is a story about a particular interaction that we as humans have had with different species. And then the first one over here is Memento Mori. Um, and it talks about a very specific story um, of, it's, it's multiple stories. I, I find all my stories have multiple levels, but this one, was uh, very personal to me because I owned a small church in Nova Scotia that had this incredible story of being moved from one site to another along the Bay of Bundy, floated along um, to a site that's called Morden, my previously French cross. And that was a place where Acadians who were expelled from 
uh, Nova Scotia when the British took over um, from the French um, in 1755 abandoned those French, early French-speaking Acadians that were the first French settlers in that area who were driven out of their, their rich diplomas. And um, some were exported through big boats to Louisiana and became Cajuns eventually. So there was a small band of 350 people that escaped and they went to the mountain and to the Bay of Fundy where they wintered and they ate nothing but mussels during that period. And most of them perished, only 50 survived. And when they were saved by the Big Mac of Nova Scotia, by boats along the Bay of Fundy, what remained was this huge pile of mussel shells. And those shells were later incorporated into the foundation of the church at the base of the mountain. And that place became known as French Cross. And the cross that you see there was actually a cross that was on top of my church that had tumbled down. And I wanted to portray it in the black basalt volcanic stone of, of the Bay of Fundy, covered with seaweed and barnacles, um, trying, to, trying to talk about the transients of, the, of humans and um, the, the follies that we do. And they, I feel like no matter what we do to nature, the earth will be okay. Uh, we, may, we may push ourselves out of a home, but I feel like the earth will heal itself even if we're not around to see that. So this is my Nova Scotia tale. Um, and I feel the muscles really represent the kind of economic hardship that Nova Scotia has had. And muscles are kind of like a poor person's food. And so when I did this, it was Nova Scotia. When I first met my husband, I was in Toronto at that time. Uh, it was probably 96. And he, he saw me in my apartment. There was just this handful of muscles just painted in the corner there. And then it developed and finished in 1998. So when we got married and moved to California, I thought, I need something that will anchor me to this, this ocean, to the Pacific Ocean. And what would that be? Because I love this idea of all these pieces are a shell knitted, a garbage dump of refuse, but they're these beautiful cast off homes of, of marine creatures. And, um, so I, I turned to abalone as the perfect Californian um, idea. And so this one is in the back corner, and it's called Shards. And what inspired me to do this piece, I wanted a centralized element. You find in each one of these pieces, you'll have this field of shells, this midden that's up tilted in your face, and then it has a human surreal element that's uh, symbolic. It might be a geometric shape, it might be um, some other kind of element that's kind of curious. And I was searching for what that element would be for abalone. And when I heard that there was a, a group of archaeologists that had traveled from Stanford to Point Delones, which is right adjacent to the Monterey Aquarium, they did a, an archaeological dig and they found these wonderful remnants of the Chinese community that lived there. And they had been abalone fishers. And the community was so jealous of their success that they had set their community to fire. It was, it was destroyed through arson, and then it was bulldozed, bulldozed off the cliff. Mm -hmm. So when they dug, they found tons of, of everyday items. And I was particularly attracted to the pottery because it represented a food item, which was a bowl of sustenance. And I had it shattered to talk about the shattering of the community, the um, the, the idea of consumption having to be checked as well. Um, so the abalone has this incredible history in California where it was very, very ubiquitous. And the fishing trade was so high for this that they would send dried abalone to China, they would send huge wicker baskets on the train to San Francisco of live abalone, and you would go up and down the coast of California and see the beaches just littered with the shells. And you find them in now in people's gardens, but the red abalone are very endangered, and they, they come coming back. You have to have a special license to fish only certain times of the, of the year, and um, they're being farmed as well in, in aquaculture. And there's other species too of abalone that are not doing as well as the red abalone, but they're important species because you know that that's what the sea otters live off of, and each each kind of thing is connected. So after doing that piece. Um, there was, I think the next one was lure. And this is a collection of mother-of-pearl fishing lures. 
and each one has a red dot on it, and a kind of a, maybe even have a red feather, and I thought, what is that about? And it turns out that it's to emulate a wounded fish, and then a lot of the blood would stream after it, and other predators would say, oh, that's an easy meal, and attack it. Mm -hmm. And so I kind of thought of that in terms of humans and how we like an easy buck, and we can go through something that's accessible and easy, and we don't look at the point of sustainability where we should hold back a little bit. So the, the sides are of painted um, the yellow mussel from which these um, other pearl shells were made, and they were farmed to the point of near extinction on the rivers in, in the U.S. So the red circle in the middle talks about it's kind of like a seeing red, a red lens, a lens that we look at through things, a lens of predation is sort of what I was thinking. And you'll see these mother pearl fishing lures, uh, the very ones in this in this uh, bait ball that was constructed in this year in 2022. So other stories, and pause if you if you have any questions and <laughs> uh, let me know. But um, I'll try to do the kind of order. This one in particular, um, this one is called Blue Sailor, and it talks about the microplastic that is flooding our ocean. So all these little dots are bits of plastic, and I wanted to have the little toy sailors as representing, you know, our footprint and not as a blue toy, but it's come to this monster. And what I found so fascinating is that jellyfish do really, really well in a polluted ocean that's acidic and warm. So they explode in population and they outcompete the krill for the microorganisms in the water. So these, this image here, these are little blue sailors that are called hydrozoas. They're called, their, their name is Valella Valella. Mm -hmm. And I was walking on the beach in Davenport with my children. I must have been, up, I don't know, maybe uh, eight years ago. And the whole beach was flooded with blue. And I had never seen these creatures before in my life and I didn't know what they were. And I gingerly picked them up to take a look and see. And I researched them. And so through the research, I found out about jellyfish. I found out about uh, a deep sea diver who had taken this picture of microplastic and the Valella Valella and created this piece. Um, and just recently in Hara Dunes, I saw another huge tide of these beautiful Valella Valella on the beach. And by the next tide, they were gone. So it's like this, it's such a gift at low tide to see these things that you have this connection with something much bigger than yourself and realize. Uh, it, it just, I, I like to sort of just ponder the possibility of all this. And, you know, this whole exhibition was very interesting to me because, I mean, I'm just so grateful to sh show my hometown, but my studio is very white and bright. And to, when all these pieces were collected here, it's dark, it's, it's, it has this beautiful lighting, it's this kind of quiet, reverential place that felt to me like a shell grotto. Mm -hmm. and, they existed in antiquity. There were sea caves that were only accessible at, at, at low tide. And they were often considered to be associated with the divinity. And during the 17th and 18th centuries in Europe, it became very popular to try to emulate those as follies in the garden. And they would be you know, dark spaces to ponder the diversity of the divine's work in, in the shells in flowers. And some other places were, were more elaborate and, and sort of architectural. And they would demonstrate the very rich owner's um, wealth because the shells were very expensive, because they were collected from all the new colonies across the world and imported on, on arduous sea journeys. And uh, they're really a demonstration of, of their erudition and their wealth. So. Um, but I love the concept here of like just reflecting for a moment on a creature, its place in the world, and our place in the world. Um, I'm not going to go into particular order now, but the one across the directly is a painting of, of horseshoe crabs. And what I found um, fascinating about them, first of all, I have this connection of my brother and I would go to my uncle's place at, on the Piscataqua River in, in Maine. 
at low tide and see these amazing creatures that are prehistoric mm -hmm. covering the beach and we would go and touch them and just be enamored by them and they're just they're scary but beautiful and curious and quiet and they're actually they're not a crab at all they're an arthropod and they have a special quality in their blood which is actually this baby blue color that's called LAL which is uh, let me see if I get this right um, limulus amoebocyte lysate and what's so special about this blood is that it can clot around bacteria and render it inert so that's how they survive in the ocean mm -hmm. um, any kind of function they would get that was their defense system and the FDA found that they could use this property in testing drugs and, and surgical instruments uh, so they would live tap them they would line up all the the, the horseshoe crabs in the lab and tap their blood filling up these bottles and then they would release the ones that survived which was like 30 percent and the ones that did go back didn't reproduce as well so it was really a, a critical time for horseshoe crabs that have lived for so long mm -hmm. and they've been abused by using this fertilizer and then this live tapping so fortunately they found um, a synthetic substitute for this LAL. But I used the circulatory system of the horseshoe crab as this pattern radiating up from the horseshoe crabs in this picture. A um, couple more. Do you remember in 2015, was it 2013, 2014, there was a huge die off of sea stars all along the Pacific coast? It was like the biggest mass die off of a single species in history. And it's, I was looking at that absence and what it meant. So this, they figured it was the Denso virus, which had been detected as early as the 1940s, but it never had this kind of impact. So why is all of a sudden is this happening? So they, they think that it's a combination of the warming waters, which is caused by um, climate change, by the, the cap the um, additional carbon in our environment, plus pollution and plus acid. So that combination of making them less resilient to the Denso virus and the virus were just like, they would just melt. They would just fall apart and turn white. And it affected all of the starfish species, um, which is hard because the starfish are a keystone species in the kelp forest. They keep mussels and sea urchins in check. And so without them, the sea urchins just devastated kelp forests, which is like the whole basis for abalone and sea otters and all the creatures that um, have nurseries there in the kelp forest. So fortunately, a lot of the little babies that are shown to have more resistance to the Denso virus, so not all starfish species are coming back, but the Pacific stars are doing a really good job right now. Um, the, uh, you may have noticed the pink one with all the flip-flops. Um, that's called shell midden, modern midden. And I have a uh, brother-in-law who has a place in, in the Bahamas, and we would go and see tons of, of conch all over the ground, and uh, there's a huge trade in eating conch, uh, both locally and um, internationally. So they need a, a, a lot of space to graze, because they're like cows of the water. Hmm. And um, without that, without having enough conch within a certain hectare, they, they just can't reproduce. So in this piece, I wanted to talk about my love of this beautiful animal and also my love for going to the beach and having fun. And, and I'm a tourist, I am a beach lover, and all of, you know, we have a lot of trash that goes out to the ocean, and the flip-flops symbolize that. In fact, there's so many flip-flops in our ocean jar that washes up in the, on the beaches of Africa, and they make art out of it. But I wanted it to um, talk about, like, they represent our human footprint, our tourist footprint in the environment. and. I wanted it to be a beautiful invitation to consider these things, and also kind of a reminder of why we love these spaces and love these creatures, and how we want to how do we want to continue to love them and exist for them. So the most recent pieces, and I'll try to be quite short now. Were in 2022, I created a moisture melt barnacle bottle and bait ball, and the acidified oceans are really problematic for the oysters because, and many of the mollusks, they are based, they're calcium carbonate um, shells that they lay down. So when they're little, they have a real struggle to lay that down. 
um, and that's the hardest time for them. So I kind of indicated the calcium carbonate kind of melt to talk about that. And with barnacle bottles, I was kind of excited that these glass bottles, the barnacles could, like, we don't care, it's a substrate, we can make our home in it, out of it, we're good with it. I thought, well, maybe that's so with plastic, but it turns out certain barnacles, called the gooseneck barnacles, can attach themselves to plastic, and that that washes out to, to sea, and it creates like a whole little mini environment where it can transport a lot of other microorganisms to places that it shouldn't be. So yes, barnacles travel on boats, that's an issue too with, with the, uh, um, the uh, transfer of um, um, microorganisms and species. And that's kind of the Anthropocene too. I mean, we as people are traveling all over the world and bringing plants that don't belong, um, bringing you know, diseases and parasites. And, and, um, but especially with plants and animals, it has a huge kind of impact on local species. Um, lastly, Bait ball is kind of um, a fun combination of some of these elements. So it's round like many of the organisms, like the shapes that I try to use in many of the pieces. But what it's, it is, a bait ball is like this massive of anchovies that swirl around in a protective kind of ball. And it works really well for them, except for when a whale comes and maybe swallows up the whole ball. And I wanted my bait ball to be made out of a shell. So this is like shellfish. All these are like based on clamshells that are plastic. So it talks about the clamshells represent us um, and how we are both a species that pollutes a lot. A lot of these plastics, even though they're recyclable, do not get recycled. And um, a lot of them are creating like a plastic jar in the ocean. But um, so it talks about our consumption overfishing as indicated by the, the fish hooks and I have mother of pearl fish hooks in the lures in the middle which um, they're made from mollusks so the mother of pearl is actually the nacre that they lay down in these beautiful layers that helps them slide in and out of their shell and in the very center there are these beautiful little mother of pearl fish that are carved from mother of pearl they are um, 18th and 19th century gaming tokens from China that early on when China opened up to trade, a lot of um, ships went down and filled up their hulls with porcelain and also brought home these beautiful little gaming counters because there was, in the parlors of Europe, they liked to play card games and they needed to count their winnings and their losses with these counters. So I loved the idea of them as shellfish and representing, well, fishing in general, and they looked like the anchovies that I saw at the bait ball when I was to sleep over at Monterey Aquarium with my kids. I got to spend the night under one of these bait balls that just moved me so, so much. So I like that there's this kind of contrast between the precious, the mother of pearl is often associated with, with the Virgin Mary, and it's used in a lot of religious material and Catholicism, and um, and then the, the plastic, um, which I feel has been a little bit transformed by the context and the shape, and once you get the, the labels off. And then it's just suspended by like fishing line to create this kind of floating mass. So I'm kind of excited about just that it's more in your face, and it, it has some of the same concepts as the paintings, but in a different kind of incarnation. So I guess my hope with this exhibition is that people are, that it arouses some kind of curiosity about the particular stories that are talked about with the individual paintings. But also I hope it like strikes a chord <coughs> with the viewers about what is your experience with the ocean? Do you have any childhood memories? Do you have any, um, do you take your own kids to see the ocean at an early age? Do you look at tide pools? Do you see the little creatures that are moving around and think about how what are the connections between how we are living and how they are hopefully continuing to live? So that's kind of, um, that's a very long story and I've been talking a long time, but I would love to know and, and, and bring out, like if there's any stories that any of you have about 
an ocean experience, a, a point of a low tide, hitting the beach, just anything that has moved you. And I should have like put a little note to have people think about this before they came. Yes, Jeff? I don't want to say a personal story. I just want to thank you. That was absolutely beautiful. And this is just stunning. Thank you. And this is so creative and amazing and, and meaningful. So thank you. Thank you, Jim. Are there any questions? Um, I'd love to take questions, and if, if, if people can't think of a question right now and would like to think, you know, find me later, um, I'd be happy to I talk your ears off. <laughs> yes? How, how large are the um, crabs in real life. These are almost all life size. Oh, almost. those are. Yeah. So I had an actual horseshoe crab, you know, exoskeleton in my studio that I used as a reference. So they're they're that big. Oh, cool. They're Thank incredible. You. Yeah. They're they're just amazing animals. <laughs> yeah. Yes, Carolyn. I love what you did with some of the edges and I think the horseshoe <laughs> crab is my favorite. Oh, but just the pottery shards. Ah. Uh, um, if anyone hasn't seen the edge of the horseshoe crab, it's all little pills. They're pharmaceutical pills that are dotted like confetti on the edge. And um, it's just sort of like a little aside. I'm so glad that you noticed that. <laughs> yeah. So I'm hoping that it hasn't been like an instructive like lesson about all the things that we bad people do, but it's really kind of a celebration for me um, about what we have in our oceans and and just being really grateful that I have lived a life where I can experience those things. Um, and I encourage you all to spend some time in the ocean this summer. So, so I have a question, Marie. So you talked about going out the, the Bay of Fundy and the low tide. So is that very, very different than what we have here on no, the California coast? Big Sur sometimes reminds me of this in Nova Scotia. But so Nova Scotia is a peninsula. It looks like a, a lady's pump. And all the beaches are quite different. Mm -hmm. So you have a lot of sandy beaches on the on the western side. And the Bay of Fundy in particular is like comes up from Maine and New Brunswick and Nova Scotia. And it's basalt rock, a lot of granite rock, a lot of amethyst. Mm -hmm. It's really very dramatic. So no sandy beaches there, but a lot of it's great shell be um, mussels love a good rocky beach. So <laughs> they're they're there for sure. But um, yeah, the Pacific is very, very different. Um, I know that sometimes in morning I would go for a long hike to look for amethyst and be stranded on a cliff and the high tide would come in and I'd have the choice to swim around or just wait for six hours until it changed. <laughs> and I chose to, I swam one time, another time I just took a nap. Um, but, so the, the tides here aren't as, as steep, but it's really dramatic to see we have a place out of Pajaro Dunes and to see the bird life that lives there and just, I walk with one eye on the water and one eye on the, on the sand to see what turns up. And sometimes there's fossils of, of, of um, ancient buffaloes, that, no, a bison, sorry, that live there and uh, um, just shells that you've never seen before and it's just exquisite to to find this whole, I love, I have a lot of shell guides where I mm -hmm. study to see what it is that I'm looking at. It's, a, it's just so great to, to know stuff. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. I just wanted to say that um, you took the hard subject of reality of climate change and you put it in your canvas in such a beautiful way. Well, oh, that's so lovely to say. Yeah, I wanted to like have people like feel the joy that I feel in the seeing these creatures. And you know, I was saying to someone that I love loose paint, like this one's a bit drippy, but I also really wanted to go very detailed to have, like to try and portray these incredible animals and in a kind of realistic way. Um, but I want, I think there's like, you, you, I love the contrast of, of beauty and ugliness and sadness and funny and dark and light and putting those things together in a curious way. And I'm hoping that, you know, it, people will pause to take a look at that. And I think it's like the, the thing with attracting more flies with honey. Like I don't intentionally do that, but probably that's what sustains me too. A little bit of honey. Yeah. Um, is that a technical question? Yes. Uh, how did you work? So did you do um, small mock-ups of these, or did you just, you know, they 
died in the center and you just died and died in the So when I do paintings, I often have yeah, stories that I listen yeah. to and I hear, like, I think of, um, I can visualize these things before they're done and I, I know what I want to do. So I just go in with my models and I have the comics. I didn't have a starfish, I had reference material for that. But um, I have the bottles with the, and I hold them and I photograph them in different ways. Where do you start? Where? Where do you start? Mm, I probably start yeah. here in the middle. In the middle, yeah. yeah. Yeah, and I do very loose, um, gestural, thin paint outline. So I draw with paint directly on there. And oil paint is great because it's very workable and um, I can erase things with the mineral spirits and let things evolve. So I just work on draft. I call it Alla Prima, but it's not, because it usually takes about three months for me to do a piece. So that's that. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, they're like loose sketches that they outline, because I want, I hold them in different directions, because I want there to be a visual um, appeal of how they're lying. I want them to look naturalistic, but I don't want to be, if you have too many bottles lined up the same way, your eye will go to that and say, what, what, no. Because <laughs> in nature, that doesn't really happen in alignment. So, um, yeah. That's my process. Um, it's <laughs> yeah, so I was excited that of all these pieces, this is the first time that they've been shown all together. And certainly these three have never been seen before. The only time, the only ones that have been out, um, Modern Knitting was shown at the De Young Open. Um, which was an incredible show that the Dayan put on. It was open to Bay Area artists. And of 11,000 submissions they took, I think 800 artists. And so it was just a joy to be part of that, especially in light of everything shutting down. They, it was a very generous move on their part to open up. So I can go back in the Dayan and I say, oh look, there's Picasso hanging where I'm painting. <laughs> so that was thrilling. And then um, both, it also showed at the Trident Museum of Art, um, along in another year at the, so they have a, an annual competition for Californian artists. That got in one year when, when George Rivera was curating, and um, it was a juror. <laughs> and um, I don't remember that who jurored um, Abalone in, in a previous year, but that also showed at the Triton Museum of Art. So. But it's my, this is my, really the debut of the Critical Masses. So mm -hmm. I hope at some point you get a chance to read some of the notes. There's a little bit about my biography, but there's a beautiful piece that Julia wrote about Solstagia, which is the idea of um, the sadness of the environment changing, which I think is an exquisite kind of term, which is new to me. So. Yeah. So thank you so much in the bottom running heart for everyone for coming. This has been just a real milestone in my career and I'm just very happy to share it with all of you. So thank you.